Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme I'll be talking about global warming with that daredevil mountaineer Chris Bonington, about Palestine 40 years after the Six Day War with Hanan Ashrawi, and to that splendid actor Bill Nuhi, but talking about his recent visit to Africa and the G8 summit, and there's a link. But first, Brazil. Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, Lula for short, has been president of the South American giant since 2002. When he first came to office, he was hailed as a sort of new kind of Latin socialist leader. Since then, of course, much of the thunder in that area has been stolen by Venezuela's Hugo Chavez. But Lula, in a less extravagant way, has established himself firmly as the most powerful man in South America almost the only leader in South America who can simultaneously keep good relations with Venezuela and with the USA. Earlier I went to Brazil's UK embassy to meet President Lula. Mr. President, one vital question. How is it that you and Brazil go on producing such fantastic footballers? I believe that Brazil continues to produce the world's best football because we are exporting players abroad and also because of the blend, the melting pot of races in Brazil. We have indigenous people, blacks and whites and all these mixed together to produce a swing of excellent quality not only for soccer but also for samba. A real United Nations there, yes. Tell me, um, back in 2003 when Goldman Sachs put Brazil, Russia, India and China together as the countries which would dominate the world economy by 2050, uh, called by people the BRICS, um, do you think so far that of those four, your economy is slightly lagging behind? No. <laughs> no. I believe that it is important to understand the reality of each country. Brazil is a country that had a lot of opportunities, but never took advantage of them. Because in the past, people tried to make magic of the economic policy. We decided that we would take the economic policy very seriously. So we developed three aspects. One would be to build domestic and foreign credibility. Second, we would have to control inflation. And thirdly, we would have to make the country grow. And that is exactly what is happening in Brazil. Today, Brazil is experiencing the best economic moment of its history. So, Brazil has everything to become a great economy even before 2050. In terms of um, President's, uh, President Bush's um, recent visit to Brazil and indeed to uh, Latin America as a whole, there were a number of uh, hostile demonstrations and so on. Do you think that uh, America has got serious work to do to win back, win back the feelings of Latin America? Eu acredito que historicamente I believe that all this is due to the fact that the Americans developed wrong and mistaken policies in the past. And this helped to generate this anti-Americanism throughout Latin America. And that is why it's said in the region that poverty is caused by US actions. I think that the policies which the Americans developed for this region in the past, for South America, for Latin America, were a mistake. But I don't think that they are the only ones to put the blame on. Our ruling class is to blame for not solving the poverty problem in the region. But if the Americans change their policy, 
and help us get out of poverty. I am sure that that sentiment will change. What are the, um, the mistaken policies um, which you referred to? What are the policies that they need to change? For example, for example the Americans supported military coups that we had all over Latin America. They supported coups in Chile, in Argentina, in Uruguay, and in Brazil, just to give some example. It was a grave intervention in the politics of Latin America. And then, whenever the Americans needed to come up with a policy which would help bring development to this region, nothing came of it. And it was that policy which created this anti-Americanism. And they have such a negative image now. Because intervening in Vietnam, intervening in Iraq, intervening in the Bay of Pigs, examples like this don't help to build a favorable image for the United States. Of course, um, President Bush uh, and President Chavez are very different people, but, but you have good, good relations, really, with both of them, don't you? Do you think you can serve as a, a bridge between them? I believe that between President Bush and President Chavez, that between President Bush and President Chavez, it is now almost impossible to develop any new relationship. But I believe that with a new president in the USA, it will be possible to develop a better relationship between the two countries. I also think it's very funny that Presidents Bush and Chavez are fighting, because on the one hand, the U.S. needs to buy oil from Venezuela. And on the other hand, Chávez needs to sell oil to the U.S. So I don't understand this fight very well. One of the reasons for it is that for years, the ruling class in Venezuela was subordinated to U.S. interests. And President Chávez also believes that the U.S. was behind attempts to overthrow him. So that is what Chávez is now trying to change, to put the relationship on a better footing. But I think that only with a new U.S. president, this relationship will improve. And in terms of uh, dealing with President Chávez, is he the sort of man that if you, you can criticize him or he can criticize you and it's all good for the relationship, or is he not that sort of guy? <laughs> not only in the role of heads of state, which we both are, but also a real friendship. We have friendship, and we have brotherhood. That's the kind of relationship we have between ourselves. We trust each other. I can trust him, and he can trust me. If there's divergence, then no big deal. I can state very clearly my position. He can state very clearly what he thinks. If there's divergence, I will continue with my position, he will continue with his, and we move on. One example of that actually would be, I suppose, uh, ethanol and biofuels, which you're great producers of, and which President Chavez and Fidel Castro are not keen on. Um, but you, you think they're wrong on that? Of course. Chavez has a lot of interest in oil, and in oil production, because Venezuela has a lot of oil. And so biofuel will never have the same interest for him 
that it has for other countries like Brazil. The other point is that Venezuela buys ethanol from Brazil. So what we see is that every country has the right to define and to decide its own energy interests. And that's a decision for each and every country to make. Although we in Brazil are self-sufficient in oil production, we want to make our contribution to depollute the world, to generate jobs, and to help the poor African countries to get rich. My dream is that with biofuels and with ethanol, we can help these African countries to become wealthy countries. What I want, to sum up in a nutshell, is to create wealth, jobs and income distribution. And while we're on the subject of world trade, Mr. President, um, do you think there is any chance of an agreement in the world trade talks, which have been stalled for a year or more now, and the, uh, the fast track that the President Bush has in, in America um, runs out on June the 30th? Is there any hope of a deal on that, do you think, before June the 30th? Eu tenho esperança. Primeiro porque eu sinto que I have hope. Os líderes europeus we can advance if there's willingness from Europe, from the United States and from the G20 countries. I have been working very hard in this direction. I've telephoned all the major world leaders twice each since last December. All the economic issues have now been dealt with. Now is the time for political decision making. That means that Europe has to grant more market access to the poor countries. The US has to diminish its subsidies. And the G20 countries, Brazil is part of the G20, have to bring more flexibility to the service industries and to the industrial sector. If we don't manage to reach an agreement, this will be an seen as an act of cowardice on the part of all the leaders of the world. Because with no agreement, they cannot dare to continue talking about terrorism and peace matters. Because it's the poor that will suffer. And we will continue to have peace threatened, more terrorism, and so on. The moment is now. Now is the time to make agreements that will give a chance for the poorest countries in the world to develop. There's one bold policy you've just announced, and uh, which is for uh, subsidizing birth control uh, pills, and you unveiled a program on Monday about providing that. Um, obviously, Brazil is the, the biggest Catholic country in the world. But obviously, in doing this, you think that this will, will be popular because there are more Catholics who would like birth control than the leaders of the Catholic Church admit. A política que nós anunciamos de planejamento familiar. What we have just announced is a policy for family planning and it had broad support from all sectors of society in Brazil. We want women to get access to birth control pills to prevent unwanted pregnancies. It's among poor families that we have too many children. So we have to develop campaigns targeted at the poor. It's a policy that I'm sure will have the support of the majority of Brazilian society. Because our aim is to take care of the lives of the very poor. In Mexico City, uh, they, they have even uh, got a program to uh, encourage or subsidize Abortion, would that, is abortion part of family planning or not? Eu 
sou contra o aborto. No, I'm against abortion personally speaking. Nós However, in the case of adolescent pregnancy precoce, or unwanted pregnancy, our National Health Service cannot simply turn its back on people's desperate situation. Otherwise, people just look elsewhere for abortion and can die trying to do that. It affects the very poor, not the middle class. So there's a real split here. I, as an individual, as a Christian, as a family man, I am against abortion. As head of state, however, I must develop policies to help the very poorest. Our thanks to President Lula. Join me in a few moments when I'll be talking to mountaineer Chris Bonington. That's after this short break.